Welcome to House of Champions, YouTube friends, dropping your comments and questions in the chat and make sure you hammer the like and subscribe buttons as we obviously look forward to reviewing what happened with FIFA, the best. And House of Champions today, we have Nigel Rio Coker, Michael LaHood, and over in Paris, Jonathan Johnson. Nigel, how you doing, man? I'm great, mate. Always a pleasure to be with you guys as always, mate. Ah, Michael LaHood, how are you, mate? Um, I'm doing really, really well. Just dusting off the Carabao Cup win with Manchester United and wanted to say that with Nigel Coker and Jonathan Johnson on the show. <laughs> they were about to play their next game after that game, Mike. Oh, uh, 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 no. Time is over. <laughs> Did, didn't you listen to Ten Hag's press conference? The celebrations are over. We're focusing on the next game. JJ, how's it going, man? It's been a busy, busy week for you in Paris. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, things have been really kicking off in the in the French capital these last few days. But I can say at least that I was able to enjoy Sunday night's action. I don't know about Mike Lahoud, but uh, I, I I quite liked what was going on on the pitch in the south of France. Yeah, you did. <laughs> what a great performance that was, JJ. Real quickly, the um, interaction between Messi and Mbappe in that game was something unique and special to watch, right? It was, it was, you know, it's great to see, but uh, as we know, sort of the, the value of PSG season is going to live or die by that second leg against Bayern. I guess the one thing that I yeah. would say is if they perform the same way that they did there, they'll score goals against that Bayern side. I don't know how many Bayern will score against that leaky defense because Donnarumma played another, you know, fantastic game. But uh, yeah, for, for me, if Mbappe and Messi are sort of in that kind of form, they will score goals in Munich. Oh, shout out to Amy, who's already in the chat right now. Good morning, Chelsea FC. Maybe relegated no silver up to about eight weeks right there. <laughs> Interesting comment and firing away already is Amy. Good morning, afternoon, everyone from BX Gunner 81. Let's get into it. Okay, the best. Lionel Messi beats Kylian Mbappe, Karim Benzema. Two best FIFA men's award. Messi won the 2022 World Cup with Argentina, of course, in December. The country's first World Cup in 36 years. I mean, pretty much ending his own personal weight for the only title that eluded him. I'm going to have to come to you, JJ, first here for us, because obviously watching Messi every single day, getting an opportunity to be close to him. Um, this is a big moment here. What was your overall opinion? Obviously, Mbappe also, the two of them sitting next to each other at the award ceremony. You're always going to be happy when, you know, someone from your own team or a friend actually wins the award. But would you say it's, it's well-deserved for Lionel Messi to win the best? I mean, I think it's understandable given what happened at the World Cup. And unfortunately, I think that, you know, many of these awards, uh, you know, especially given that it's a FIFA award, are going to be conditioned by what happened at the World Cup. Uh, you know, I just feel that the the thing that's so frustrating about, uh, you know, the the best awards uh, just, to, just in general is it, it feels like, uh, you know, it's all very kind of like put on. A lot of the, the decisions don't make sense. I and mean, I know that we're going to come to it in a bit, but stuff like, you know, you give... Uh, you know, Emmy Martinez, best goalkeeper in the world, but then don't put him in like the, the best 11. It's just it's just bizarre. And that to me is the perfect example of, of how this is literally just sort of awards given for, you know, sort of the the, the favorite players, so to speak, not necessarily those who deserve yeah. it. Now, specific to Messi, I'm not saying that he didn't deserve it. You know, it was a fantastic achievement helping to lead Argentina to the World Cup title in Qatar. Um, you know, and I don't think anyone begrudges him the success that he's still enjoying at this stage of his career. It's not about that. It's just a lot of the sort of stuff that goes on around it kind of feels like, you know, very uh, put on. And it's, I mean, I, I've never really placed that much importance on these, uh, you know, the the best awards. And we can have the same debate as well about the, the Ballon d'Or. But does Lionel Messi deserve recognition for what he's managed to achieve in the last couple of months? Absolutely. You know, if that's just yeah. another one of these, these awards, then uh, so be it. But do I put great importance on the best? No, not particularly. Yeah, I'm I'm happy for Messi because of what he and Argentina did. I'm similar to you, JJ. I don't really lose sleep about this in terms of who wins the best player of the year award. I mean, Kylian Mbappe was a Randall Colo Moani finish away from being the winner of this year's award. My grievance is the best 11. How is Vinicius Jr. not on this best 11? This guy scored the winning goal in the UEFA Champions League. If you're looking at the calendar year, breakout season for him, the main man now at Madrid put on a freaking clinic against Liverpool most recently. I think that that needs to change. You need to get players like that, reward players like that, more often than not. I would actually replace him with, I don't know, maybe Kevin De Bruyne. Yes, reigning Premier League Player of the Year, but hasn't had the season that we're used to seeing from him. I think that's a change that needs to happen, amongst others. NRC? NRC? 
your thoughts overall? It's all bollocks, mate. Sorry, can I say that? Yeah, <laughs> I just did. <laughs> you can. It's just, listen, it's a popularity contest. Like JJ said, I agree with JJ. I can understand Messi winning it. You know, he's won the World Cup. That was always going to be a no-brainer. But all this stuff, generally, it's just a popularity contest. And it's people in the media and the press who put a lot of emphasis in certain players. And that's why they'll probably get recognised. It's like anything. It's a, a little bit of brainwashing to a certain degree. And it's these yeah. players that are constantly mentioned, these ones that are constantly put in the press, in the forefront, so people are going to vote for them. You know, and it, football is such a unique game. You can have some players who are so important to football clubs who never get mentioned in the limelight. And it's more than just the ability on the pitch, but it's what they bring to a dressing room dynamic and, and, and everything else that comes with it. And one thing, let's be honest, Ian, you've been there too, Michael. There's big egos. There's big egos in football dressing room. And if I don't like you, for some other personal reason beyond football, I'm not going to vote for you. That plays a big part. JJ's worked with footballers as well in his previous job at Sky Sports. He's interacted with a lot of footballers that I believe that JJ would think they're absolute horrible human beings. But to other people who never get to meet them, they might be portrayed as these unbelievable great people just because of the football aspect of it. So ego plays a part. I don't take any of these stuff seriously as well. And I think uh, it, it's a lot of BS at times. But the, the big question the big question is, would the tactician in any of you put a, together a team on the pitch that has three defenders, three midfielders, and four strikers? <laughs> Sounds like no. something that PSG would try. Yeah, yeah, definitely. PSG <laughs> would try that real quickly. Nigel, just on to your point right there, uh, obviously the voting going. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo voted for Mbappe. Is that um, clear evidence hey. there that he doesn't like Messi or he just wants to take <laughs> the shade, shine away from him? And I'm, I'm being honest, though, but isn't that true? Though? Let's be real. Messi was always going to win it because of the, the World Cup heroics, right? We can all agree to that, that he was going to get this. How can Cristiano Ronaldo say there's no rivalry and we're friends and stuff like that, and you don't vote for the man who actually won the World Cup? Because, again, that's just showing to me personally that, yes, they might act like they like each other in the public eye, but there is a rivalry there and there's egos there. It, it just doesn't make sense to me that you say all that and then you don't vote for him and you vote for Mbappe. Mbappe had a brilliant World Cup, you know, and I think for me, it's not just the World Cup. You look at the whole period, yeah. I think Luka Modric deserves his vote and, and, and deserves a lot more recognition. Throughout the whole year, Luka Modric has been sensational. And for me, in my opinion, I think when you look at modern football now, he's probably the closest I've seen to a Zinedine Zidane. But is he really going to get the limelight? Is he going to get the love by the press and the media? Because now we're so centric on Mep Messi and Mbappe. And it's all about goal scorers because the game has changed so much now that the narrative has been put on goal scorers, goal scorers. And, you know, there's so many other great football players out there who are not goal scorers, but they're not going to get the recognition they deserve. Listen, it is unconfirmed that Cristiano Ronaldo did vote for Mbappe, but I did read several good articles, probably five or six, that confirmed that he did actually vote for Mbappe. So really excited to see if that comes to fruition and where that goes. Um, let's look at the best 11 again, if we could, producer Des. Mike, I'm coming to you here quickly. Who doesn't mm. deserve to be in here? Because one player in particular that stands out to me, who's been great in his career, no doubt since he's been at Liverpool, Virgil yeah. van Dijk has been one of the best defenders in the Premier League. But of late, and including in the World Cup, I was not impressed. And uh, I'd have to say over the last 12 months, also not necessarily so impressed that says he should uh, definitely be in this uh, best 11. Yeah, I'm so glad you're bringing this up. And I, I purposely didn't mention him because I wanted to hit at this and hit at it with a lot, a lot, a lot of directness. What the hell is Virgil van Dijk doing in there? I don't think he should be in there. That's a disrespect Stop to the speaking lights. Speaking as a Man United fan. <laughs> <laughs> nice. This is why I wanted to be on today's show, just to banter with you. But back to Virgil. He doesn't deserve to be in there. I mean, this takes away the credentials of this award. A player who I think deserves to be in there, RB Leipzig, Josko Gvardiol. One of the best defenders, I think the best defender at the recent World Cup. If this is a World Cup sort of reflective sort of award that we're putting more emphasis on, he should be in there as that middle center back. Mind you, he also did a heck of a job on Erling Haaland in the most recent Champions League tie, and you can catch him on Paramount+. Plus on the second leg. I think he is worthy of this award. JJ, real quickly, I'm coming to you, and I know it's uncomfortable that I'm coming to you about this one here, but Hakimi gets in the best 11. And, and I, I, my personal opinion is football performances were excellent throughout the World Cup, but also for Paris Saint-Germain, being very impressed with him. I'm a big fan of him as a player, um, but these recent allegations certainly not helping him, obviously being recently accused of rape. That's unconfirmed, of course, but um, not a good situation for Hakimi. Um, was interesting to see him on stage. Your thoughts on that? 
I mean, to be honest, the whole sort of situation from yesterday evening has been a bit um, weird. I mean, there's been a lot brewing over here in France, and we'll get to it later uh, with the, the French Football Federation president, Noel Legret, uh, moving on while failing upwards because uh, he did land a job in FIFA, but we'll get to that in a bit. But <laughs> one of the stories that broke as well was about Hakimi uh, now being investigated uh, you know, for an alleged rape. I mean, it's very, very difficult to sort of say much more about it at this stage that hasn't already been said in the the report in Les Parisiens because it's it's them who have run it so far. There hasn't been any sort of official confirmation uh, or statement or reaction from the from the club. It has to be said. Um, mm. So I think many people are just sort of waiting to to sort of see if that report uh, from Les Parisiens stands up. Um, According to that report, um, there hasn't sort of been uh, any willingness to push charges from the victim just yet. Uh, so I guess it it sort of leaves it kind of up in the air as to to to, to which direction this one will go in next. So it, it is obviously you know very very awkward, but you you would have thought that there would have at least been some sort of discussion about whether hacking or you would have hoped that there would have been some sort of discussion about whether it was appropriate for for hacking me to be on stage um you know given uh you know what was reported i mean pretty much in the same hour or two hour period uh you know as that award ceremony was going on uh in paris as well so obviously uh you know very surprising and just sort of the latest in a number of kind of uh you know controversies which have been going on sort of in and around the french capital this past 24 hours or so and you know fingers crossed that at the end of the day as with any sort of case of this kind of gravity that at the end of the day the you know the truth wins out uh you know more than anything i think we all like uh you know hakimi as a as a player and sort of this image that you get of uh of him as a guy as well i know the the story surrounding him and his mom uh, you know the world cup was was fantastic and one of those kind of feel good moments uh, of the tournament but equally at the same time you know something like this has to be taken extremely seriously so if there does seem to be sort of substance to the story you have to hope that you know the the french authorities will take it in hand and uh, and, and do what's necessary yeah, difficult moments for PSG and Hakimi on to the field, JJ. Difficult moment for a certain player, Neymar, injured. What's the latest with him as it pertains to the upcoming tie against Bayern Munich? Will he be fit? I mean, PSG's injury situation is interesting. There hasn't been any further update yet on Neymar. Um and there is expected to be some sort of update this week. Obviously, he was ruled out of the, the Classique against uh, Marseille. Uh, you know, so I guess it's now a race against time whether he's fit to play against Bayern. I very much doubt that he'll be ready for the game against Nantes. I mean, th this is also him re-injuring the same ankle that he injured at the World mm -hmm. Cup. So the chances are that this could keep him out for you know another couple of weeks him being back in Germany seems doubtful to me. But then again, look at the way the PSG performed against Marseille without him. Perhaps that makes things more simple, at least, you know, if you're Christophe Galtier, it does. But what makes life hard for him now is that Neymar's not the only PSG player injured. You've got Kim Pembe as well, whose season is over. That has been confirmed already. He's undergoing surgery for a torn uh, tendon, uh, Achilles tendon. You know, that is him finished, not just for this season, potentially even for this calendar year, because, you know, that is a very difficult injury injury to come back from uh you know the chances are we might not even see him until uh 2024 so it's yeah it's it, it's been i guess a costly moment in psg season losing the likes of neymar and kimpembe but equally uh, you know if that kind of performance against marseille points the way to victory against bayern then uh you know i guess galtier will, will accept that cost JJ, you sounded like a robot for half of that, but we appreciate everything you said. And we actually got to hear everything you said, which is great. Unfortunately, um, not the same for Mike last week. But Mike is back, uh... though. His microphone is working. Um, obviously, Nigel, real quickly on this Neymar situation. In my personal opinion, I watched the performance at the weekend, and I actually favored Paris Saint-Germain because Neymar wasn't in the side. I don't know. Do you feel the same? That PSG might be just a bit better yeah, without him? Yeah, this... Team and all? Ian, we had this conversation a few weeks ago. Neymar definitely his time at Paris Saint-Germain is up, in my opinion. And I think that Paris Saint-Germain can see it themselves that Neymar's time at that club is up. Like, they need to move on. But the problems that they've got is Messi hasn't really committed his future to the club. So that's still ongoing. And Mbappe has become president, player, GM and everything of Paris Saint-Germain. Um, he's pretty much running the club. It's there and obvious for everyone to see. And that's a big gamble and that's a big risk. You know, I think sometimes... Players just need to be themselves and go and play the game of football and enjoy it and, you know, not be scared to be themselves. I think I can't I, personally for me, I don't like it when these players come and try and protect themselves of this image and this and that. 
eventually this thing called life will catch up to you and you'd expose yourself. So you might as well just go out there and be authentic and be yourself. I'm not saying you have to go out there and be stupid, but the way that Mbappe is trying to do things right now, it kind of reminds me of Messi at Barcelona. But whether he'll be given the same kind of respect, it's time will tell. Yeah, great comments right there real quickly. JJ, I'm coming back to you. Obviously, I want to test your connection once again, just to make sure you still sound like a robot. Um, but in, the Kempembe injury at the weekend, listen, I thought performance from Paris Saint-Germain at the weekend yeah. was sensational to watch. And um, really impressive to see that type of performance in a big game in a difficult environment. But the injury to Kempembe, JJ, is something you need to be really concerned about. I was very, very sad to see him go down so early on in the game. But as soon as he went down, you knew it was serious. So what's the latest on him? Yeah, I mean, you know when a player goes down uh, and there's sort of nobody in and around them sort of in terms of, uh, you know, touching them physically when they go down by themselves that it's, you know, more often than not going to be a very bad injury. And then when you can see him sort of burying his face in the turf, you know, you kind of knew that it was pretty much curtains for at least the next couple of months, if not the season. But it has since been confirmed that he will undergo surgery. So that's him out for the rest of the campaign. Uh, and, um, you know, you'd have to assume as well the rest of the calendar year because it's a really, really serious uh, injury, you know, to, to, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys, you know, tearing an, uh, an Achilles tendon. I mean, it's pretty much as bad as they come, certainly in terms of sort of rehabilitating yourself and getting yourself oh, back. Imagine it, pitch. JJ. I'm still, I'm still hurting from that one. <laughs> But I mean, if, you know, this is a guy as well who was coming off of a very lengthy injury that already cost him his place in the World Cup squad as well. So, you know, a real tough, uh, you know, bitter pill for, for PSG to have to swallow. And it leaves the defense looking very, very ropey. I mean, Mukiele coming back is useful given his versatility because he can play in the middle as well as, uh, you know, as wing back. But, you know, Ramos, Marquinhos... Danilo Pereira, it, you know, it, it doesn't look particularly convincing as a three-man back line and you're going to have to be going with at least one sort of makeshift centre-back if you throw Mukiele in that mix as well. And then you've got the likes of uh, Bitschabu, who is very, very untested, sort of certainly if, if we're talking about the Champions League. So, you know, Kim Pembe, it is a big loss and obviously, you know, really, really tough one for him to have to take as well because this season has been absolutely ruined by injury. Uh, JJ, I'm glad that you're mentioning Kim Pembe, and uh, I'm not sure if we lost you a bit at the end, but uh, first off, congrats to PSG, and I, it's a bitter pill to swallow as an OM fan, watching the devastation that happened. As an OM fan of how many months? Um, <laughs> going on six now. As many, as many months as he was a United fan, JJ. <laughs> hey, For as many months, months as you've been on the payroll. <laughs> you're, 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 worse, you're worse than my granddad. My granddad's gone from like Brighton, Portsmouth, United. Basically, whoever prom- was highest up the pyramid. I promise I will stick with OM through and through. The kits are awesome. The fans are awesome. The stadium is badass. <laughs> But she's <laughs> I should have stayed on for Thursday. Damn it. But, um, you know, I go back to the Bayern match when Kimpembe came on at halftime. You saw a shift in PSG. You saw order restored in the back line and just his presence alone. He's an out and out defender. He's not going to be the guy who dribbles up and makes that forward pass. He's going to hammer someone and give you that physical presence. Can he play? Yes. But this is a massive loss for PSG sticking in Paris, though. Let's talk the wider scope. Club football is one thing. The French Football Federation. What in the hell is going on? Because this is the gift that keeps on giving, JJ. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a really tough one to stay on top of the last couple of days because there's so many different moving parts. I mean, I'll try and break it down as as best as possible. So you've got the situation with Nolo Gret. We've already discussed it on this show where he had that weird rant about Zinedine Zidane after he forced through Deschamps' contract extension after the after the World Cup. He's now resigned. He's he's stepped down. Basically, it was hinted to him that the best thing for him to do was to to step aside, sort of save a bit of faith, uh, not just because of uh, you know that disrespect towards Zidane, which turned everyone in the French game against him, but this raft of allegations against him, uh, which basically provoked this audit, which has been done into the French Football Federation now uh, and has obviously found some very untoward behavior. So Le Gret has sort of left in disgrace having to resign. Yet guess what? He's been offered a job by FIFA, apparently, and uh, Infantino is now basically going to charge him with 
overseeing the, the the Paris office, according to one of the members of the executive committee. So when uh, he spoke after this meeting, apparently Le Gret is actually going to be put back into circulation. He's not just leaving the game, uh, you know, sort of with his tail between his legs. So that, that one was sort of one kind of incredible update from this. And then the second, so you've got this kind of like mini mutiny within the French women's team. Uh, you know, you've got a, a number of the players led by Captain Wendy Renard, uh, who have basically stepped back from the national team essentially putting uh, pressure on Corinne Diak, who is the, the current head coach. Uh, and now her future was set to be discussed today, but because of Le Gret actually resigning, uh, that's now been pushed back until I think March the 9th. So there is expected to be some decision made on her future. Very doubtful that she stays on. Whether she resigns or whether she's sacked, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But with no Le Gret there, uh, the uh, you know the, the FFF weren't actually in a position to make any decisions regarding hiring or firing, so they've had to set up a separate group with executive committee members to have that discussion about Diak in a in a week or so's time. So yeah, it's it's all pretty uh, pretty crazy, and then sort of. The backdrop to all of this, the political stuff, is even more crazy because you've now got potentially Jean Mejololas, obviously the head of uh, Lyon, who could hand over to Textor since the the takeover and potentially take over the French Football Federation and really push for the setup of a fully professional women's league. You've got Mark Keller, whose Strasbourg were recently linked with Chelsea uh, and a potential buyout there. He would have to sell up his stake in the club if he was to take up the, the FFF presidency. But I think the candidate that inter interests me the most is Michel Platini. Another formerly disgraced a French footballing uh, politician who could be put back into circulation if reports are to be believed. Uh, you know, you've even got the likes of Emmanuel Macron, who would be very favorable towards that sort of thing. No decision will be made before June. Uh, I believe that was also, uh, you know, part of the FFF uh, executive committee meeting. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it's been a hell of a last couple of days in Paris. Uh, it wouldn't be French football without the drama the soap opera antics and I thought personally that FIFA the 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 mafia dismantled a couple of years ago but obviously the mafia of FIFA is in still it's still operational that you could lose your job and just go upstairs and work for FIFA like this is unbelievable what goes on and all the things that we're seeing right now and for all the football fans out there yes as much as we love this game of football politics plays the part just like in every industry and circle in life and I know people who work for FIFA and they have told me politics comes first before the football. And that's just the reality, whether you like it or not. To see these type of situations happen and these people still working within the game with any other industry or any other work of life, they would have been sacked and they're away from it and that's it. So in a way, it's, it's still FIFA has a long way to go to clean up house. That's all I have to say on it. I don't me, people like me and you are not welcome in places like FIFA because we, <laughs> we say the truth. Okay. So um, obviously it is what it is. I uh, just want to remind everybody out there. We also have a great podcast that you can go follow from the CBS sports family of podcasts. That is the attack in third. We have uh, Sandra Herrera and uh, Lisa Roman, who's covering that. And if you want more on the women's team drama that's happening with French football federation, please go and check that out. It's a great podcast. Lisa and Sandra are doing a great job and uh, a lot of great guests and covering the women's game extensively so please feel free to go ahead and check out that podcast as well uh, one of many great podcasts that we have on the cbs sports families of podcasts so uh jj i'm gonna let you go at the break because um i feel and i sound like you need a little bit of help from my best buy guys okay so <laughs> what i'm gonna do is gonna take a quick break Everybody's going to be able to enjoy this promo that's coming up. I'm going to call the Best Buy guys real quick. They're going to send them over at Paris, sort out your audio, and then hopefully on Thursday when you're back on again, we'll get you with uh, better audio. Uh, you, Otherwise, you, you, can, you can hear my hairy little son in the background uh, <laughs> taking exception to what you're saying. <laughs> I think Michael Hood is actually giving you his microphone from last week. That sounds to be the case. But no, no, listen, we got everything you said. It was just a little bit of practice. So guys, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually on water over here. That might be the issue. <laughs> Maybe. I'll Sounds see you like guys soon. More like wine. All right. <laughs> see you later. Everybody <laughs> going to take a quick break. More to come from the boys who do have good working microphones on House of Champions when we come back. Stick around.
this. Don't miss a second of action from the greatest club competition on earth. That is the Champions League. Follow the biggest stars from the world of soccer like Lionel Messi, Karim Benzema, Victor Osman and Erling Haaland as they try to clinch the most prestigious prize in the beautiful game. All of your soccer needs from the Champions League to Europa League to Serie A all the way to NWSL plus so much more are available to you on Paramount+. Plus. You can try one month for free by using the code ADVANCE. Yes, that's right, Nigel Rio Coker, using the code Advance. Welcome back to House of Champions, everybody. We finally got rid of JJ and his dodgy microphone or dodgy internet setup, but I do have Michael Hood and Nigel Rio Coker in the house with me today, and I'm looking forward to previewing what's to come during the week this week. Michael Hood, I'm coming to you first because there are some games mm. to look forward to on Tuesday. We have FA Cup games going on. We have Serie A games go going on. We also have the Turin Derby. Any game in particular Ooh. on this fine Tuesday that you've got your eye on? Uh, I'm looking at the Turin Derby for starters. I think that this could be a massive, massive game for Juventus. They're climbing back up the table, coming off a big Europa League win. First time in a while we've seen them score more than one or two goals. Dusan Vlahovic is back to scoring. Angel Di Maria putting on a masterclass. But the injury worries around Federico Chiesa, that could be a longer implication on the resurgent run back into the top four race. I think this is a match to watch. Nigel Rio Coker, me and you both have um, an affiliation, kind of a love for the FA Cup and the beauty of the FA Cup. There's some great games going on today. We have Stoke against Brighton, Leicester against Blackburn, Fulham against Leeds, Bristol City against Manchester City. I've got my eye on that Leicester City against Blackburn Rovers game, Nigel. Is it possible that we could see Blackburn, who are fourth in the championship, cause a little bit of a stir here to that team in the Prem? You would like to see that, Ian, but I doubt it because this Leicester City side now has been really rejuvenated by yeah. um, Brendan Rodgers. And I, I'm a big fan of Brendan Rodgers. I think he's a great manager and I really feel that he could do it at the highest level. You know, and it's 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 crazy to say this, but I think that if Brendan Rodgers was at Chelsea right now, Chelsea would be a lot more successful than they are under Graham Potter. I feel Brendan Rodgers has the personality, has the aura to handle those big characters and those big superstars I think Graham Potter is a step too far. But I'm actually got my eye on um, the Fulham Leeds one. I think that's yep. going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one that's going to be very close. Leeds coming off a big, big win this weekend, uh, a six-pointer against Southampton. And obviously, yes, it's FA Cup. But I think that now we're going to see whether their priority lies because I can see Leeds maybe changing their side and going for a slightly weaker side. But again, Fulham are doing great in the Premier League and a cup run will be fantastic again. And again, it's uh, another great kind of run or club that's been done well under Marco Silva. Well, another show you can go follow is In Soccer We Trust with the uh, US soccer legends, Jimmy Conrad, Charlie Davies, and Heath Pierce on there. And they'll be excited about that game, Nigel, because, Michael, it is a battle of the Americans in that game. You have Tim Ream, you have Anthony Robinson, obviously, on Fulham. Mm. You have Tyler, and you have Weston, and uh, who else? Brendan Aronson Brendan you have Aronson, on, yeah. uh, on Leeds. Um, so this is a, a big game for the American public to enjoy watching. Yeah, I can't forget Chris Armis in the dugout. Shout out to him for uh, keeping the job and staying alive in the Premier League. But I'm, I'm really intrigued by this game from a Fulham perspective. Yes, you have the Americans. I think Anthony Robinson, Tim Ream, credit to him. He's really come on strong since the World Cup, showing the confidence of being part of that USMNT World Cup push. And Anthony Robinson, this guy is one of the most underrated left backs. Part of the reason why Fulham is having a really, really strong season. But the worry for them is no Mitrovic. The injury problems with Mitrovic as of late, that's a big concern for them. But have no fear, Manor Solomon is here. The Israeli international, he's been in Fuego as of late. Three goals in his last three games. This guy, and he's coming off the bench, doing wonders for Fulham. Keep an eye on him in this matchup. And for Leeds, just coming off a 1-0 win, confidence may be restored. We don't know. This could be another make-or-break sort of momentum builder for them as they try to salvage their season. Ian. Of all players to name, Michael picks the Yanks and doesn't talk about Mitrovic, how much of a, a saviour he's been for Fulham, even though he's injured. Hey, hey, you said it late. You said it late. No. Mitrovic is named the first name that comes out your mouth for Fulham. And then Andres Pereira in midfield. <laughs> the midfield pairing in Fulham is phenomenal. But you want to yep. talk about the Yanks. No problem. I understand you're American. It's fine. No problem. It's no, going to be a no class. But I guarantee you the Leeds trio ain't going to play because they're going to concentrate about staying in the Premier League instead of getting relegated. So I think they'll put the FA Cup in the back burner, which is sad to see because you want to see a strong side. But 
it's still the magic of the cup is going and anything can happen. You know, we can have our wants, but anything still can happen in the cup. Amy jumping in here with a great comment. Preston versus Coventry. Also, Luton against Millwall trying to steal producer Dez's job, apparently. Let's move on to <laughs> West Ham. Because there's a lot of barnstorming games to look forward to. In the FA Cup, we have uh, West Ham at Manchester United, which is a big game, Mike. I want you to touch upon that yeah. one as well. We have Sheffield United against Tottenham Hotspur in the FA Cup. That's a tricky one for Spurs right there. Chef, you obviously knocked out Wrexham and broke many hearts here in the United States of America from people who have been fallen. <laughs> Incredible Wrexham story, and also Wrexham played pretty good in that game. Um, but Manchester United against West Ham, what are you expecting after the success of the League Cup, the celebrations, Ten Hag straight back in the press conference, boys are back on the training pitch. They mean business, Manchester United. What are you thinking? And they'll have to mean business against the West Ham side that's coming off a 4-0 four no, four win. United, everything is really clicking into high gear. There's a believability. And and winning cups, winning championships, winning a trophy, they, they give you an added confidence. They, they really create that ambition and expanding that ambition into, wait a second, we can go for another trophy. This is the first of possible four trophies this season, and these players are kicking into high gear. When they play against a West Ham team, though, they will have to be wary. West Ham, not very good on the road this season. They've been one of the worst teams in the Premier League. Marcus Rashford, he has been the West Ham killer. The last two games against West Ham, who scored the winner? Marcus Rashford, 1-0 wins for Manchester United. He will have to punish them and put them to the sword. Early goals against West Ham, team to pay dividends for them. They will do well to get one in the cup. But the longer it goes, 0-0, that favors West Ham in this matchup. Nigel, where do you see this going? Obviously, West Ham minus Danny Ings because of him being cup tied for this game, um, which is unfortunate for them. But um, West Ham at Manchester United, Moyes gone back. Thoughts? Giza, come on. Let's be real. Like, <laughs> West Ham got a win this weekend, but I've watched them a lot this year. They're not the West Ham of last season. There's, there's, this is a know. different West Ham. And the Man United that they're facing is a different animal. Like that. Hey, Nigel, that before you go on, before you go on, oh. what is what's changed from West Ham? Because watching them last year in this European Honestly, run, they were fantastic to watch. Listen, Ian, you know it as well. They went on a fantastic run last year. There's a lot that was taken out of that run. The new signings they made haven't hit the ground running as other clubs have. You know, they still haven't really meshed with the rest of the team. They're struggling to score goals this year. They're not playing at the same high energy and high tempo as it was last year. These guys are human beings. It's the same yeah. thing we're seeing with Liverpool. Let's be real. We what we marveled at Liverpool for the past three or four years. It's impossible to ask those guys to still play at that high level, high tempo of the amount of games that they play. They got mm -hmm. beat by Bayern Munich, uh, sorry, a Real Madrid side in the Champions League, where they don't play at a high level or high tempo. They play at a decent, steady level with world class players. So for me. It's not the same West Ham we're seeing. Yes, they beat Forest this weekend. And if they didn't beat Forest this weekend, then there'll be some serious problems. But I just feel Manchester United right now are ascending truly at a remarkable rate. I still believe that they're secretly trying to compete for the Premier League title. And it's not just the top four. They might not say it out there publicly, but in that dressing room for sure. And I think it's going to be a very difficult game for West Ham. And I can see Man United winning, especially being at home, winning the cup, back in front of their fans. It's going to be a very difficult e afternoon for West Ham. West Ham would be happy to stay in the Premier League this year, I think. I agree with you. I think everyone would be happy to stay in the Premiership, uh, <laughs> Premier League with everything that comes with it financially. Uh, Matt jumping in and saying too much pressure on Marcus Rashford to be the goal scorer. His run will eventually end uh, yeah. and run out. Then what? That's the question mark right there. It was also interesting comments from Sir Alex Ferguson saying that uh, Marcus Rashford is not a centre forward. He shouldn't be that striker. But at right now, when things are working, why change it? Veghor seems to be enjoying himself as well. United on a roll. Will that continue against West yeah. Ham? Uh, go ahead. You know they're, they're 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 fine with it right now. It's around. They've already got their list it ready works. for the for the, for the yeah. summer, and I'm sure probably Osman is top of that list. And if Osman comes in, and imagine that Osman <laughs> coming in and Rashford on one side, Man United oh, would be days. a scary feat. How, how much, Nigel, for Osman? How much would it? Because I mean, listen, I'm not sure that everyone wants to leave Napoli, but when you have big clubs coming in with big big money offers, Napoli have to sell. Listen, Ian. When you win the title at Napoli, after what, 25 or 30, whatever years it is plus, you've won the title at Napoli, you're playing in the Champions League, you don't think that's the best time to leave Napoli because Napoli are a selling club. They're not going to look to keep that same team together for another run next year. They're going to sell players and bring other people in. That's what they do. You leave at the height of your, of your career at Napoli. You leave now. Mm. Manchester United are a worldwide force. The money they can make from Osman, shirt sales and this and that, and he is a top striker. You can't deny that. Going into that team... 
they could be scary. How much? Well, I don't like to put prices on, on, on players, but I'm sure Napoli are going to want something with at least in the 100 million. And they have they bought right. him for 70. They bought him for 70, which at that point I thought, oh my God, that's a lot of oh, money there. Well, Mike, how can, much do you think? definitely get 100 for him. Oh. Who else is doing it? There's not I, many strikers I, I, yeah, in Europe that's yeah. doing it. I agree. Seeing the likes of what we've seen in the transfer market, and, and the market has cooled compared to where it used to, the trajectory it was going a couple of years ago. But I think this is a transfer, if it was to happen, that could go in the 150 sort of range because he is that important to Napoli and Napoli will want to cash in. If they are forced to sell their player, they will want to cash in against all odds. Yeah, Chelsea are not listening to anything you're saying, Mike, when you say the market has calmed down. <laughs> They're spending money. And as soon as you said 150, Todd Bowley phoned up and said, we'll take him for 180 instead. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, like Sheffield, United, like Sheffield United Spurs, go ahead, finish it, and then we'll get to Chef, no, go Sheffield on, go, Spurs. Go on, it's fine. I just want a prediction from you, Sheffield and Spurs. Uh, it's going to be tough for Spurs, but I can see Spurs getting a win. I think that they're starting Mike. to slowly get together again. 2-1 Spurs. Mike? Yeah, I, I think this has a 1-0 uh, Tottenham Hotspurs. Uh, Harry Kane getting the goal. I'm wary about Spurs, though. Last time they had a big win in, in the Prem, they bottled it against Leicester, but FA Cup is different. Premier League, Nigel, Arsenal against Everton. Uh, real quickly, your prediction on that one. Quick thoughts? Hey, anything can happen, but... you. Common sense, you'd have to back Arsenal. I think Arsenal right now, what Arteta's got with the team and stuff, they're really focused and, you know, they're, they're ready to go. Um, Everton is just going to take another real superhuman performance. High energy, high tempo, pressing them high. But can Sean Dice really lift that dressing room again with a f inconsistent result recently? But I, I would say Arsenal will get the job done, but it won't be easy. 1-0 yeah, Arsenal. Ars I agree with you. I, I'm going to say, I actually think 3-0 Arsenal. I think revenge will be on their minds because of what happened in the last game. The fact that Trussard is getting involved in the final third, he'll be a boost for them. If Michael backs Arsenal, that means Everton are going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Liverpool against Wolves. Nigel, uh, quick one from you there. I know people keep saying I keep going against Liverpool on purpose and, you know, I'll hate... I can see a Wolves win. I'm sorry. I could see a Wolves win again. <laughs> Liverpool is just going to be inconsistent. I can see Wolves getting the job done because Wolves are in a lot more dire situation than Liverpool, in my opinion. Like They're fighting for survival in the Premier League and I feel that they'll raise their game up because it's Liverpool and Liverpool just still don't look convincing. They didn't look convincing against Crystal Palace. You know, there's a bit of inconsistency going on. I think they'll just be happy for this season to end right now and get ready for next season. <laughs> I agree with you, Nigel. And this is the, one of the few times all week, all show that we will agree on something. I am picking Wolves to win. And no Drake curse. Please, no Drake curse for this one. Because in midfield, Mateus Nunez, Liverpool don't have an answer for him. I think in the last couple of times they played each other, he was a standout performer. He'll make a difference. Keep on hating, Nigel. We're here for it. <laughs> Scousers in the mud. L -M -A. I'm not hating on oh. Liverpool. No. Nope. Is that I'm Albert? Is that back. Albert? Is he back? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's turn our attention away from England. Let's go to Spain where Copa del Rey is taking place. Also sooner against uh, Athletic Bilbao. Bilbao been poor recently. I've watched Oof. the last couple of games from them. They've been pretty Same. poor. Yeah. Tough one against Osasuna. Uh, but let's turn our attention to El Clasico. It's Real Madrid against Barcelona. Mike, I'll come to you on this one. Um, I mean, listen, we're still looking to see if there is going to be a title race in La Liga. Um, but I love seeing when the big guns go head to head in cup competition as well. So what are you expecting from this game? I am expecting Real Madrid to wipe the floor with Barcelona because injuries happening at the wrong time for FC Barcelona. Yes, they get Busquets back, but this is a Barcelona team that's coming off losing against Man United, crashing out of the Europa League, and then in the return, going to La Liga, losing to Almeria of all teams. Almeria, no Lewandowski potentially. Not sure if that's confirmed. No Pedri still out. Gavi back in. Yes, he was suspended from the Europa League. Back in, but still no Usman Dembele. And I'm hearing possibly no Rafinha. That is your attack done. Don't see it from Barcelona in this tie. Nigel. I am with Michael. I personally look at it slightly different to Mike. I just think Barcelona's latest loss gives Real Madrid a great opportunity and they smell blood and they're going to be high on, on confidence right now still because they're doing well in the Champions League. They're still within touching distance. They're not completely out of the race for La Liga title. And I just feel that it's going to be Real Madrid. It's going to be a different animal we see in this El Clasico and it's going to be sensational. And I see a Real Madrid win. 
Just a reminder for both of you there, if you do look at the injury list that is out, it's Lewandowski, Pedri, Dembele, and Sufati that are on that list right now for Barca. But for Real Madrid, it's Rodrigo, Mendy, and uh, David Alaba just recently added to that one after the injury at the mm. weekend um, or previous to that in the cup game. Um, but Mike, real quickly, on that Barcelona performance at the weekend, first time they've lost there, that was woeful. One of their worst performances I have seen. We also heard Xavi coming out and criticizing his team more heavier than I've ever heard him criticize his own players before, but simply not good enough from Barcelona at the weekend. No, and it reminds me of some of their performances that we saw kind of at the start of the season where Lewandowski was bailing them out. And I think it's one of those things where the cracks in the pavement have been there since the World Cup break, but they've been eking out results, one no results, their biggest result coming against Real Madrid in the Supercopa. And when you do that against a rival, that can paper over so many of those cracks. But I'm, I am worried about this FC Barcelona team. What they've done, though, They've been able to grind out results to create that cushion in league form. But I think that gets exposed in this first leg against a Real Madrid team that will be buzzing after the dismantling of Liverpool in the Champions League. Nigel, I know you've got a story or two, and I've got to touch upon it here. Producer Des put this in uh, the, the rundown. Um, Rafinha injured apparently after kicking his fridge. Um <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've all heard some crazy injuries, right? We've, we've all been there, right? As players, we all know someone or played with someone or met someone or heard stories about someone getting injured in the most ridiculous ways. I have one, which I can't say on air. I'll have to tell you off air. Um, it, it involves a sexual position where someone got injured. That's why I can't really tell it on I'm air. I'm with you on that uh, one, mate. <laughs> oh, wait, man. wait, yeah. was it you, Listen, Nigel? Was it you no, that story is about? It wasn't me. <laughs> Well, I know who probably it was, the, they're Nigel. probably the best ones I've heard, so we can't say it on there. <laughs> Have you heard of anything other than that? I've heard slipping in the shower, I've heard slipping, falling, playing with the kids, hurt the back like anything crazy that you've heard or known about? No, nah, just yeah, just the usual falling down the stairs and and um slipping, running in the house or something like that. They're the only ones that I've heard that can say, but there's there's loads of other ones that you said that are for after dark <laughs> episodes. Which uh, cognac club, cognac club, cognac club, <laughs> ER visits, and some cigars. So, yeah, but I do promise fridge, that that's I will. a new one. Kick in the fridge. I wonder why I'll kick, kick the, the fridge. Huh? How did he kick the fridge? I mean, that's crazy. Like, what, what, what happened? Run did you run out of beer? Did you run out of beer or something? You had to kick the fridge. No one did the shopping. What these pampered footballers, man. I tell you, oh, like. You know, uh, the, the most PG one um, is a surfing incident that a former teammate was told not to surf. And he went and got a surfboard anyways, ended up getting in a surfing accident, black eye, and came in and lied to the entire locker room and the manager that he got beat up by a bunch of thugs down at the pier. Well, what he didn't know was the manager and his family were watching him surf the entire day he got in the accident. Oh. <laughs> so. He got wow. it, it was it was it was it was a bit ugly. Yeah, yeah. Lesson lesson to those young boys: do not go surf if it's not if it's in your contract to not do so. Just don't do it. Look at all. that comment. Look at that. Look at that comment there, Nigel. Who remembers Darius yeah. Basso drilling a hole <laughs> in his toe with a power drill? I remember that. Oh my days. I remember that story. And if the crazy thing is, we got Sharopidis at the clubs as well who come in. So I don't know why he had a blood clot, I think, in the toe. And then when when you get stepped on the toe a lot with bloody boots all the blood dries up. So you want the toenail to fall, but I don't know why he did that himself. There, there's, there are some crazy stories. There are some crazy people out there. It's more about the individual than anyone else, it's right? True. I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? Uh, real hey. quickly, our final thoughts before we get out of here, Mike, obviously Alvaro Rodriguez is a player who's pretty mm -hmm. hot right now on the top of the tongue. Real Madrid believe they've found the next superstar here. Um, what are your thoughts overall? Have you watched him much? Have you heard much about yeah. him? No, I, I'm excited to see him. Obviously, we saw what he could do at the weekend, getting the equalizer in the 85th minute for Madrid against Atletico Madrid in the rivalry. Shout out to our producer, Des Norris. I know that was a difficult result to stomach for Atleti <laughs> fans, especially Des. Sorry, Des, had to bring that up. But prior to that, though, what really, really kind of influenced my liking of him was what he did in one of his debut matches against Osasuna. Comes off the bench, wins the ball. He's got pace. They compare him to Erling Holland. I know there's probably more closer comparisons to likes of his compatriot Darwin Nunez for Uruguay. But this is a kid, young player. When you think of the future of an aging Madrid player like Karin Benzema, he's 
the heir apparent or told to be the heir apparent for Madrid. Really like this kid. He's got the speed. He's got the height. He's got the move in the box. Now it's about getting the composure consistently. Does he's, he link uh, up play? He, <laughs> he, he can. Fresh. He can. Okay, yeah. Good. He, but he then, looks very this, fresh. And this is quickly before we finish. I just want to say, this is why I always say to you guys that when some clubs are run differently like Real Madrid, there's a system in place. And however long it continues, that's great for them. But you've got to give them respect and, and, and credit for how they run that club where the scouting network, the players that come in, managers just go and just manage. Every other club still does the same thing where they get a manager. Oh, we need this identity with this and that. And it's a constant turnover of players. You're never going to be sustainable. So cl until clubs have a real good football structure in place of types of players they want, caliber of players, a manager's coming just to manage. That's it. Because it's not a rocket science formula that Real Madrid do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get the best they can get, the top players that identify them for a reason or purpose. They go in there and they perform and play and they let them know what's expected of them. That used to be Man United, but now, you yeah. <laughs> know. No, no, it's done. Uh, real quickly on Alvaro Rodriguez, I watched a game at the weekend as well, Michael, and he looks younger than 18. By the way, born yeah, on the no, same yes. day as myself, just many years after me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I was impressed with how big he was. Like, he's a skinny mm -hmm. boy, right? He doesn't have yeah. much about him. He clearly needs to get in the gym a little bit. But he is six foot four, I believe. He's a big boy, a big and boy. that presence right there to to have that type of an um, an impact on um, a game like that was very impressive for me. And to see the reaction yeah. as well right after it was was super impressive as well. well so great stuff. Mike. Last, you finish last for me, yeah, last for me, Ian. Big headliner in this. He is from Catalonia, rejected by Barcelona, developed by Madrid. It's written in the stars for this kid to be a difference maker in a tie like this. I'm just saying it beforehand. Look for him to be a difference maker. You Americans love a story. Jesus Christ. Let him do it first before you start telling a story. Jesus. Nigel, Nigel, you sound oh irked. You sound irked today. Is, is, that, that, trigger, over is that a trigger? Is that a trigger word? Story, storylines, headlines. <laughs> uh, story guys, we're pushing... Magic. We're pushing 47 minutes here. Uh, shout out to Kieran Priest, uh, Pierce Priest, Priest once again, who was on the step master yesterday. Let us know, by the way, on social media. If you want to go follow us across our social media platforms, please do so. Um, Kieran reached out to us this morning after us making fun of him about our episodes and how long they were because he, he stays on the episode until our episodes are finished. So um, we, we got to 47, almost 48 minutes for you on this one hey, today. That's a great Kieran. workout. We appreciate you. I'm sure Nigel and Mike and the boys have made you chuckle a few times along the way, but uh, big shout out to everybody. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for also listening to House of Champions. Please take a minute to leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And I mean that. Please make sure you go leave us a rating and a review. I don't just want to say this every single show. I want you to actually stop what you're doing right now and go leave us a rating and go leave us a review and let us know exactly how you feel about the show. It would mean so much to us. We are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast. And we are, of course, also available on video. So subscribe to us on YouTube as much as you possibly can. Spread the word about the show. Uh, like, subscribe. Everything you do helps our show grow. Uh, the bigger the show gets, it's all down to you because of the love that you're so showing the show. We're back again on Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern for a recap of what happened in El Clasico, Copa del Rey, first edition, because there is two legs in that game. Can't wait for that game. A lot of games going on Tuesday, Wednesday. Everybody out there, enjoy the games. Nigel, Mike, appreciate you, boys. See you on Thursday.